So I don't want to hear it. I no. told really you stop it. So, but why though? Because I told you so. Oh, it's text from Callahan. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's playing Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. I've been really curious about how that game is. Oh. Oh dear. He doesn't want to hear it either. I told him so. Welcome to another episode of Unqualified Experts. I'm your host, Braden Gardner. Your corrupt overlord, Shane Dayton. And today we're going to take a little trip down memory lane to the days before online gaming was prevalent. The days of video game cartridges and discs being your medium for your video game fix. When a game went out, it was done. There were no updates, no patches. You spent your $50 to $60 and you rolled the dice on what you got. You might have gotten a Konami or Capcom Classic, or you might have gotten an LJN <laughs> Clunker. But you knew what you were going to get was going to be a finished product. You never had to yep. question whether there would eventually be more. Yeah, and there, were no, there was no Greek alphabet involved. So just to give a disclaimer, I am not super technical or exact, so we may interchange terms like early access, alpha, beta, release, pre-release. So if those get interchanged a bit, no need to send the internet mob after me for semantics. We're just kind of using those interchangeably because it's the same idea. Though speaking of mobs you can send after us, please feel free to mob our like and subscribe button. It's a small, easy, free way to help us so we can keep giving you great content as we dive into everything about gaming. And thank you for the awesome support for those of you who already have. So, the button like this, also a big red one. Hopefully he does editing so I don't look like a moron there. We'll see. I'll consider it. I told you so. But, <laughs> if you haven't guessed at this point, we're fast forwarding closer to the present now from the days of yesteryear and we're talking about early access and the <sighs> pros and cons therein how we've kind of shifted from the days of alphas and betas being treasured exclusive prizes to be lorded over your friends and other gamers alike versus now where it's just a cash grab it, it's a business model i'm very conflicted about now, one thing I will say that is not semantics, I am always against pre-purchase versus early access. Because pre-purchase is just the worst of the worst. I mean, let's go through the short list. Fallout 76, No Man's Land, Ghost Recon Breakpoint, Watch Dogs, The Order 1886, really pisses me off, that should have been a great game. Assassin's Creed Unity, the Disaster That Was Earth, year 2066. And recently, gee, I don't know, uh, what's that one Callahan's been complaining about? Oh yeah, Cyberpunk. <laughs> yeah. So, there is no reason to ever pre-purchase. Every single year we see disaster after disaster. And once the company has 2 million people who forked over 60 bucks, they don't have any reason to fix the game. They just go on to the next title. And as long as you keep prepaying, it's going to keep happening. So what if the game actually is great, complete, and finished? Cool. You wait one week to see all those positive reviews come in. You lost seven days. You're not going to play the game ten years from now anyway. Now you didn't get ripped off. You get to avoid the rage quitting. Exactly. And... Most of us have pretty limited gaming budgets at this point, so if you're going to fork over your hard-earned dollars for a game, you want to be sure that it's going to be an experience that is worth not just your time, but also the dollars that you're yeah. going to sink in. And you don't want to end up with a clunker in an environment where you have access to 
hundreds, thousands of reviews of games t to parse through beforehand. You can actually look ahead and see whether a game is generally well received or not, which hasn't always been the case and is one of the nice things about the information age. Yeah, and here's the thing. I am more gray area about early access because there are many reasons why I love the concept, uh, especially for small developers, small independent studios. Some of them might have an amazing idea or a brilliant little game that they just can't get funding for it in any other manner. And in that situation, you want to give them the tools and ability to make that game. Uh, one example, The Banner Saga, was a very, very different video game where the graphics were amazing. It was a very different art style, great storytelling. They had a long arc, which since has become three distinct video games, part one, two, and three. But each one was a complete game in and of itself. And after part one, they legitimately did not know if they had the funding to tell the whole game. But by going that early release, they were able to get the funds to finish it. Now, while technically not early access, that's the type of model that I think early access can work with. And I think that is one of the reasons I don't want to see it go away. Because games like that, I just, they improve the gaming experience. They give you such a different point of view, a different idea, a different creation that otherwise would have just never been made. Whereas the flip side of that coin, if you have bigger companies, established studios that have multiple big games under their belt or have been releasing AAA titles for a while, that's kind of where the cash grab comment I made mm -hmm. earlier comes into play, where they're literally just trying to get money from you before delivering a finished product to see whether they actually really need to deliver you a finished product. If there's enough just blind love for a franchise, dollars will flow in regardless. And unfortunately, one of the series that has suffered from this extensively when it comes to pre-purchasing and early access in general is Fallout. Oh, breaks my heart. Absolutely breaks my heart. And I don't think I've ever seen a studio that had such highs and lows in terms of hype. Like, the hype when Fallout 3 and Fallout 4 were released was huge. Like, astronomical, especially for 3. 3 really sticks out to me. Mm -hmm. And 3, having come out years and years ago at this point... Yeah, it had some bugs, but it came out a pretty good game. Fast forward to the latest entry in the series, Fallout 76, and you have a hot mess that is still getting negative press many years later after its release. Yeah, the most surprising thing about the server bug of hackers wiping out years of gameplay wasn't the fact that these problems were still happening two years after the fact, months after the company was warned this could happen. It's the fact there were still players sticking with it. It boggles the mind. Mm. I, I don't get it. One of the all-time great franchises cratered into the ground, in my opinion, which is widely shared in this one case. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I don't... <laughs> feel that that opinion is unwarranted or unsupported at this point, and while Blind Love definitely made some dollars come in, there was a definite trade-off this time around. Yeah, definitely. And, um, it's one of those things where, once again, don't go with the pre-purchase, and it's also the difference you often see with early access of the intention of a small developer who wants a very good game out and wants their vision out, Versus a big company where, let's see how far we can get that stock price up. So let's release it early. And that's just not the way a video game should be done. Like, I'm not asking for perfection off the bat. Another classic example, Civ 5, Civ 6. People forget they both had a lot of bad reviews when they were first released. But they kept fixing them. They were still complete games. They took the feedback... The DLCs and expansions made them better and better to the point where they're both outstanding games now. And 
that's okay. You're gonna, you can't possibly game test everything, but there's a difference between take the feedback and make it better and cash grab. And you can tell when they're doing one versus the other. Let's be honest. That's true. And in the case of the Civ games, Civ players are some another category of some of the most diehard fans of a franchise that is known to video gaming as a whole. And some of the benefits of getting in on a game early, even if it's not perfect, you get the side benefit of actually getting to play the game longer and sometimes yeah. kind of helping to shape the direction that it takes in the future, giving the developers ideas on a work in progress, which is actually kind of cool when it's executed correctly. And let's give credit credits to Civ 6 has been outstanding with this. They are clearly watching Civ 6 YouTubers, streamers. They are talking to fans to see what they like and don't like. And they are paying attention to, oh, that's a broken glitch. We fix it next patch. And that is the right way to do a game what, four years after it was released now? Five years? Something like that? It's been a minute. Mm -hmm. And that's really solid. However, for every Civ Six where you get a better, more polished experience over time, there's also an early access game that will not give you even remotely the same type of experience at its end than it promised at the beginning. Yeah. And that's the trade-off of getting into a game early that's under development. Well, and there's also a new category of games, the Eternal Alpha. Oh, yeah. There are games out there that have been six, seven, eight years in alpha development, and there is no excuse for that. That is not what early access should be. That's not what alpha development should be. It, it's just bad all the way around. I mean, if you're still... Not even in beta stage, but still alpha release after eight years. It's not good. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about that. I mean, you're not wrong. And ultimately, that's the other risk that you take with getting involved. I, I know that I keep saying the other risk, but there's always another risk. And it's that when you get involved with a game early on that's not finished, typically you don't have a time frame as a customer for when to expect it to be finished. Yep. And so you're just going to be putting dollars into a game early and kind of hoping, hey, that maybe I'll get something awesome out of it and it won't cost me later because I got in on it early now. And it just doesn't always work out that way. There are games that are either in perpetual alpha, like Shane yep. said, or there are games where they update for a little while and then just stop. And one of yep. the biggest examples of that happening is the Kickstarter for Star Citizen. Oh, oh man. <laughs> like, that's a story. This is a game that promised epic, epic exploration and space fights and customization. And it sounded amazing when its Kickstarter went off. 2012-2013. You could and say it sounded too good to be true. You could, <laughs> but that didn't stop gamers from literally handing them, what was it, $3 million? Maybe more? Yeah, it large, was it, largest of all time at the time. Yeah, it was, it was millions and millions of dollars of money for it, to basically crowdfund this game. And the initial updates started off very promising, almost as though they were going to deliver on that. And then nothing and then development of a side game that was going to come out last year that has had that bit of information mysteriously disappear from the website where it came out it's just like you don't say <laughs> now it's 2021 they're working on a spin-off of a mini game star citizen that's Never. still not coming out <laughs> okay sure Hustling, it's a good racket if you don't mind conning people. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, with that kind of money, they they can afford the lawyers to kind of keep it in perpetual legal hell, so... Yeah, and I know we've dumped a lot on early access at this point. Um, are there any other cons you want to give before I go into the good examples? Because there is a reason the early access program was rolled out, and I want to give props to the games and developers who actually deserve it. 
Uh, no, that's pretty much it. I mean, if you want to summarize the cons of early access, it's basically an easy way out to excuse mediocre quality. Yeah. And cash grab. <laughs> cash grab, basically. It's it's gross when, when it's used that way. Yeah. And contrary to popular belief with a lot of people who know us, we do a little bit of research before these shows. Sometimes. <laughs> Occasionally. <laughs> so imagine my surprise when I learned three of my favorite games I bought were early access and I actually never knew it. And I think that is a good trait to a game that's doing it right. Because they delivered a finished product, even in the alpha stage. Darkest Dungeon was alpha. Uh, from the get-go, I had no idea. You had a complete game. You had interesting mechanics. Now, there was a Darkest Dungeon controversy when they changed those mechanics at some point. And it's fair. The developers thought this game has to work with this mechanic. You had enough followers, way more than they thought they would get early, who did not like the change. And you know what? That's going to happen. It's one thing to have a disagreement where they know the final product and the player base got used to a certain experience. And I think it could be an opinion thing. You can have a severe disagreement and still say it was well done. The original game obviously hit a chord to have that many players who did not like the change. They listened, they adjusted, they still went with what they thought was best for the long run. But it was a game that from day one was a complete game, complete mechanics, interesting storyline. You did not know it was an unfinished product if you didn't look at the background. That's the way you do an alpha release. When you have the full vision, but you can still bring something polished to the table off the bat. Don't starve. It makes sense to me now this is an alpha release, but it was so good and so fun and so unique in the beginning, I just didn't care. Someday I will get through an hour without burning down the entire forest at night that has all the supplies I need to not get murdered the next night. Until then, I will laugh every time with those paper graphics as I set the whole screen on fire over and over and over again by freaking... No one believes me, but it was by accident. Sure it was. Apparently, if you run through a tor with a torch through a pine forest, it doesn't work that game. Who knew? In a world of paper, everything's flammable. Who knew? But once again, a great game, very unique point of view, and a complete play experience offhand. And The Long Dark was another one. They were basically an open-world survival game that was fantastic. I didn't even know they had a narrative plot in mind. But they knew from day one, we have this awesome system, but we don't have the time and funding right now to do the full narrative arc. So instead of putting out something that was incomplete, that would get criticized, and rightfully so if it wasn't finished, they decide, okay, here is the open world, here are the mechanics, and they polished it really, really well, made an incredible open world game, and now DLC by DLC, with the funding they got, they are putting in the full narrative storyline and another example, they've listened to the community. They've done such a great job putting in extras for everyone who support them on the way each Christmas, each Halloween even. Great job. Those are examples of everything Early Access brings to the table. Because those are great games we may not have if there isn't an Early Access program. For sure. And another example of Early Access that isn't technically early access, but I kind of want to fold into the same umbrella, is where you have a game that comes out fully finished and gets improved upon mm -hmm. after the fact. A game like Shovel Knight, where mm. you have your base character in the base campaign, and then DLCs are created for you to play several of the other knights that you fight against in the initial campaign. You're getting a whole bunch more out of your experience for adopting the game early on, which was really, really cool. And another example is one that we actually got to jump in on the release of, and that was the uh, celebration of the port for Tharsis, yeah. where the initial release of the game was considered a little too brutal in terms of difficulty, and... I'd be lying if I said that the difficulty spike isn't still <laughs> appreciable, but 
the release actually left you with the re-release left you with a really awesome version of the game that is addicting, fun, and frustrating all in one. Yeah, even on easy mode. <laughs> even on easy mode, but it's not blisteringly so to the point where it's like, well, gee, I guess it's only going to be the RNG gods that get me through this game. Yeah. Because nobody likes worshipping at that altar. No. So, and I think that's a good example. They had an idea. It didn't execute the way they wanted. They went back and made it better. And I'm always going to support that with a video game program. And that's what Early Access is supposed to do. So, do they succeed? Do they fail? Well, interestingly enough, some very, very good people on Reddit actually took an in-depth look on how Early Access has worked out for the games that went in. Okay. Now, case in point, this is a little bit old as a study, so the numbers could have changed a bit. It's two years old, and they focus mainly on all the games that came out early access Steam when the program first rolled out. So, but I still think by looking at this, because there was already four years at that point between the rollout and the study, we can get an idea of how it works. Of the original 37 games, I know math, terrible, 14 of them got fully released. Eight are abandoned, or in that postponed indefinitely hell, aka abandoned, but they just don't want to own up to it. Fifteen are still in early access, one of which had been five years at that point. Oof. Which, when you do the numbers, it's about 50-50. And when you look at the scores, like overwhelmingly positive, positive, mostly positive, versus poor, mostly poor, mix. It's literally about a 50-50 release. Half the time you get a gem, half the time you get a clunker. So, I know. Just what you want here at the end. A study that tells you it's a coin flip. Helpful. <laughs> but it shows you the complaints for early access are legitimate, but so are the positives. Especially when you look at some of the really quality games that have come out. Because small developers had the ability to get funding for their early quality work. But now, we want to hear what you think. Tell us a little bit about your experiences with early access games. Yep. Have you found a hidden gem that we haven't talked about today? Or are you one of the many who fell victim to the various clunkers that looked real promising on paper, but did not pan out in practice? Yeah. What are your best and worst experiences? Tell us below in the comments. We'd love to hear them. And please, once again, like and subscribe if you haven't already. And as always... Happy gaming. See you next time. If you like what you just saw, please support us by hitting that like button and subscribing to our channel for more great gaming content.